I uh, wanted to meet with you for coffee at the NEA meeting uh, just to kind of catch up after uh, my dissertation back in 2009 uh, where, I, where I interviewed you. And I actually turned turned it into a book. Did, did I send you a copy of that? Uh, yes, you did. I have okay. that in my office. Right. And I like the cover. That was well done. Yes. <laughs> um, my, my advisor was really pleased with uh, my work there. Um, and uh, I, I just had a, a few questions for you that I was, I'm kind of personally curious about, and I thought might help me in my life or career. So kind of, okay. kind of like a like a personal like 101 meeting. Uh, do you uh, uh, could I just kind of rapid fire ask you some of them? Yeah. Yes, okay. absolutely. Although it, I, I let me start out by making an observation about careers and career planning. Yes. Uh, people often come to me and they say. Uh, help me plan my career. And my first honest answer is you don't try because it doesn't work. Uh, with very few exceptions, most people who have had successful careers will tell you that they didn't plan them. Uh, what they did do, however, is stay very alert to opportunities. And they also were alert to the uh, to willingness to take risks. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the younger you are, the uh, less risky it is to take risks because if something doesn't work out, you just do it, try something else. Uh, and of course, as the older you get, taking risks may or may not be as, as advisable. Uh, but I have to say that in many of my personal experiences, the, the risky road turned out to be the right choice, even if I was hesitant uh, to, uh, to undertake that path. Uh, so I'm happy to have the discussion, but if you're hoping to come out with a formula for career planning, uh, you may not get one. Uh, well, it, it, that that's a lesson in itself to to know that a formula kind of doesn't work. It doesn't sort of your life or career doesn't play out in the way that you might plan. Uh, so that that's useful to know because uh, that that allows you to say, okay, I'm just going to make kind of two week plans in my life in a way and just try to optimize at each of those two weeks. Well, wait, now let's, let's distinguish plans and aspirations because I think long-term aspirations are in fact a good thing. Uh, but I would distinguish an aspiration from a plan. Uh, I consider my interest in internet to have been a long-term aspiration. Yeah. And, uh, and so I have in, in the course of my career, uh, managed to bend uh, a great deal of my career choices towards the further expansion of access to the internet. And for almost all the jobs I've had since the internet project was started at Stanford in 1973 and the predecessor ARPANET at UCLA and elsewhere, um, I have uh, pressed for uh, jobs that would have the possibility to help grow the internet. And so my long-term aspiration may have dictated preferences for jobs, uh, but I don't think that it dictated a plan for the career as much as it did uh, uh, as allow me to evaluate various uh, career opportunities against that long-term aspiration. Well, um, uh, what if you were, say, 30 years old and you had just finished your PhD at uh, UCLA, I believe? Wasn't that 1972? Yes, that's uh, right. And I was just uh, 29 at the time, but that's exactly right. Uh, but what if you were kind of at that point again in your life? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious, uh, what, what, would you, what would you do as a next step? Because I, I think you ended up coming up to Stanford uh, to become a professor at that time. That's right. Uh, and, and so if, if you were kind of in that context again, uh, would you, uh, for example, move up to Silicon Valley? Um, and I'm curious what you would, what would, you would work on. You know, I think that's actually an imponderable question, and let me try to explain why. Um, first of all, uh, the choices I took, I think, were actually uh, helpful, if not instrumental, uh, in getting the Internet to happen. And so uh, you're almost asking me, would I abandon the Internet? Of course, the answer is no, I wouldn't do that. So, uh, and I, I understand that you're asking uh, not that not quite that question, but let me also say that you're asking the question in 2017. Right. And I think a useful answer to you is not what would I have done in 1972 differently, right? but rather what would I do if I were 30 years old now 
having just finished the PhD, and what would I do? And I would have to ask the first question is, what's the PhD in? Uh, right. Because my PhD was in computer science uh, with a, a multiprocessor application, which I didn't use at all. And it's, you know, it's, it's buried somewhere in some archive uh, because I got infected with networking right in the middle of my dissertation work, and I did both in parallel. But if I were starting today, uh, going into graduate school, I think I would be mightily tempted to go into some kind of microbiology, uh, understanding how cells work, understanding cell aging, uh, understanding uh, what we call grumpy old cells. These are, are cells that normally what happens is cells reproduce for a while and then they commit suicide. And uh, some cells don't, some cells get old and instead of committing suicide, which is called cell apoptosis, apoptosis, uh, right? They just, yeah, they they just sit around being senescents, generating toxins like you know grumpy old men, and <laughs> and, and and it does it's bad for your body. So if I'm completely fascinated by this whole topic of cell microbiology, and so fascinated that I got a copy of um, there was a book, right? You you mentioned yeah. that at the the seminar yeah uh, yes and it, right. it's kind of like manhattan the, the cell is kind of like manhattan and all, all the that's moving right. pieces exactly exactly right so so i actually would probably go down that path now there's another path uh if if you're uh interested in the nobel prize i would go into astrophysics and the reason for that by this time should be completely obvious because starting with this century uh we knew less about the universe than we did 100 years ago when we thought we knew everything. And what has happened in the meantime is that we have encountered these two things, dark energy and dark matter. We've encountered a universe that is not only expanding, but it's accelerating its expansion, which is quite the opposite of what we thought was going on. Um, and so at this point, we know so little about the universe that anything you do in astrophysics might win you the Nobel Prize, because wow. we don't know anything. So, so that's another, I mean, this is a bit, a bit tongue in cheek, but, uh, but there is something to it. The third thing I would observe is that uh, we are at the point now where genetics uh, is in our hands in a very manipulable form, particularly CRISPR-Cas9. It's terrifying and scary that we could uh, genetically sculpt our bodies or our children's bodies or our grandchildren's bodies um, in ways that we never could before. And the question is, should we do that? Is that morally appropriate? And if we do, What's the consequence of that? Are we going to literally create people who are better suited to live on Mars than they are on Earth? Uh, are we going to create new species? Uh, you know, are we about to, you know, essentially destroy the human race by inventing uh, a super race that takes over? And so there's that direction of genetics that's very interesting. The fourth thing. Uh, that is on many people's minds now is artificial intelligence and the use of uh, recursive neural networks. Uh, I am not in the camp that says, oh my God, the robots are taking over and the human race is uh, doomed. Uh, I think that we're more likely to use artificial intelligence as a tool for enhancing our own capacities and capabilities. <coughs> Which, by the way, was something that um, Douglas Engelbart at SRI International strongly believed in. Uh, back in the o 60s. Augmentation of human intelligence. You got it. You took it right out of my mouth. That's exactly right. <laughs> so, so that's an area of real interest and curiosity to me, to me, which is how can I build tools that make me think better? Uh, and, and I am very much uh, interested in how could I have uh, interactions of the kind that we're having right now with an artificial intelligence uh, explain to it what my ideas are, what my questions are, what my uh, uh, what, what I'm searching for or trying to uh, invent uh, and get useful feedback. But that would really be quite remarkable. What, what does the internet look like in 10 years, in 2027? So it's probably not terribly different. I hope there will be a lot more of it, of course. And by that time, I hope that maybe 80% or more of the world's population will have online broadband access. Uh, again, that depends a great deal on the economics of, uh, of Internet implementation uh, and the uh, pricing uh, to the uh, end consumers. 
I think wireless will become an increasingly important part of the internet infrastructure. Uh, we're starting to move into higher frequencies where much more capacity is available. Uh, we're also learning to allow multiple transmitters in the same radio spectrum, uh, you know, distinguishing themselves from each other by various coding methods, uh, which means better utilization of the spectrum, uh, more efficient utilization. There's no doubt in my mind that we will be running off Earth uh, the interplanetary system will be have expanded uh, probably to uh, two or three other planets at least. Right now it's just Earth, Mars, and the International Space Station. But by the end of the 2020s decade, uh, I'm sure that we'll find things that are functionally operating uh, in you know Saturn, for example, and uh, possibly uh, certainly Mars, uh, Saturn, Jupiter, uh, and you know, Earth, obviously. Uh, and maybe Venus, uh, a little not so clear about that. So uh, these would be uh, the consequences of sending uh, uh, research vehicles to those planets. And then after they've completed their primary uh, research mission, they could be repurposed as a node in an interplanetary backbone. I, so I heard you. I heard you speak in an event uh, on, on YouTube uh, where you talked about uh, 3D printing in space and, and kind of manufacturing yes. stuff like when you're already out there based on these raw materials. There, there, well, there are several things that are going on. One is to put a, a 3D printer on the space station in order to make parts that they can't get anywhere else. And if that works, if, if it's feasible, it's attractive because then you don't have to upload, I don't mean upload, but launch. Uh, you know, physical equipment into the space station, you could just make it locally. Make it on demand, if, yeah, locally. Yeah, if you, have, if you have the right material. So that's a, it's a big uh, question mark there. There are some people who are saying 3D printing using materials found on the moon or on Mars or on Bobos or Deimos or an asteroid uh, could also allow for this in situ production. Uh, and that's, again, pretty speculative, but, it, but very interesting. Uh, I'm curious about a, an advanced manufacturing capability using 3D printing, where a 3D printer is outfitted with a program to produce the initial object. And then you move that object, maybe with a robot, to another 3D printer, which starts with the now uh, fabricated object and adds more to it. This is always called 3D printing and additive printing. I don't know what all you have to do to a 3D printer to help and understand what it's got in its jig that's already been built and it's adding to it as opposed to starting with nothing. And so imagining that we have robots to move things between the 3D printers and 3D printers that are capable of being told, and here is the thing in the jig that you're starting with and here's the stuff you wanna to add to it. If we ever get to the point where we can do that, that will be a very interesting advanced manufacturing capability. I heard Vent Craig Ventner speak once about uh, building a sort of a 3D printer for DNA. Uh, so, so kind of digital yeah. biological converter, and then and then launching that to Mars, and then you know generating the 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 uh, life forms there. Yeah. <laughs> Locally, yes. That's Locally. An interesting. Well, Craig, as you know, has uh, got some pretty interesting ideas, even just for molecular uh, assembly. Uh, the ability to encode your own DNA uh, and produce whatever proteins you're interested in, uh, and then predicting what their folding patterns will be uh, is is pretty intriguing. And of course, the folding patterns of the protein is what gives it its functionality. You could imagine uh, deliberately inventing new proteins that don't exist in nature with properties that you find useful. So I, I am I'm pretty fascinated by uh, this current situation uh, with 3D printing and with uh, genomic uh, modification. And what about smartphones? Uh, what do smartphones look like in 10 years? Uh, you know, this raises a very interesting question. Uh, it's possible that they don't exist anymore. Uh, and uh, that's a sort of an extreme observation. It's probably not correct. But you could imagine for a moment that the thing you carry around uh, is actually just the computing component uh, and a small amount of radio and that every time you walk into a room, there's a big screen display and there's a keyboard or whatever. And so what you're really carrying around with you is just the core computing capability uh, and nothing else. My guess is that's probably not going to be the case because the convenience of having something that, that you can hold in your hand 
with a display capability with voice in and voice out uh, is too overwhelming uh, to be ignored. Uh, I, I think what you'll find is that they'll be very similar in their physical style uh, as they are today. There'll be more memory, there will be higher speed processors, maybe more than uh, several uh, radios. Uh, they may be they may form uh, meshes of their of their own uh, for uh, uh, let's say measurement purposes or for uh, coordinated uh, data capture uh, or just cooperative work. So I, I anticipate that there will be more interaction between the mobile phones uh, themselves in addition to between the mobile phones and the apps that are in the net. Do you see virtual reality as kind of being built into the smartphones? Well, I don't think I don't think I see much of that. I see two things. I think augmented reality almost for sure. So that you hold up the phone, there's a camera, it takes a picture of the building, tells you what the building is, hold it in front of the menu, it translates the menu. Uh, that, those are things that happen already today. Uh, I think we're, we're likely uh, to find those devices uh, increasingly useful as controllers, uh, as remote controllers for various and sundry things. So uh, instead of having 16 you know, physical remotes in your entertainment system at home, half of which have dead batteries, uh, you use the mobile as the control device. And I think that will turn out to be a fairly obvious transition. Uh, and it probably will happen you know, sooner rather than later. What about the role of machine learning in uh, the internet? Like, like, for example, Google just launched the TPU device. Uh, David mm -hmm. Patterson talked about that at, or at the event the other day. Um, do, you, do you see um, the internet, in a way, waking up because of uh, machine no. learning? <laughs> well, no. Okay. I, I really, I really think that the sensuous, you know, uh, consciousness, I think, is not likely to arise out of the internet. Uh, I think what, in order to achieve that, you need a lot more uh, dense uh, interactions than uh, than we would support in today's internet. On the other hand, uh, I think that machine learning is turning out to be a really powerful tool, and I see us using it increasingly uh, for natural language processing, for speech generation. Uh, for pattern matching, for pattern recognition, uh, for a variety of, uh, of applications, uh, including the ability to have a conversation like this one in order to achieve a particular objective. So, I, I, but I don't imagine that the robots are loose and taking over the control of the world. Okay. <laughs> um, and then, uh, what... Uh... Oh, would it be okay if I ask you kind of like a, a per personal life question in a way? Uh, sure. Not, not, not yourself. Well, in a way, a little bit. You. So so you've been married now 50 years, I think. Uh, Carla yes, and I were talking about that. We're working on 51 in September. And I'm kind of curious, like, given that you've been married 50 years, what's your what's your view on online dating? Um, do you, do you, <laughs> I don't know. Do I you, never did. <laughs> I never tried <laughs> I didn't have to. I, I got married before the internet was invented. Uh, so, you know, uh, taking this in a somewhat broader context, uh, online interactions are potentially very powerful. We're having one right now, and I find this very convenient because I didn't have to fly all the way across the country, and neither did you. Um, on the other hand, uh, we're also encountering a lot of misinformation and abusive behavior on the net. Uh, and the, this, this feeling that you're protected in this case, I have a television, or well, my you know, laptop screen, shields me from you and vice versa. You know, I can say something really uh, annoying to you and you can't do much except holler or hang up. Uh, I think that we have, are discovering that the uh, internet and the World Wide Web and a lot of the um, uh, social media that have arisen on that platform uh, give people uh, opportunities to behave badly without penalty. And I, I am frankly distressed at this uh, because it's a good example of an abusive use of this otherwise neutral infrastructure. It's a social problem. 
Uh, some of it's, uh, you know, potentially a law enforcement problem if somebody is using the net to send malware or commit fraud or do other bad things. Uh, but the getting people, uh, persuading people that uh, uncivil discourse uh, is, in fact, unhealthy uh, is a sea change that we would have to work hard on, just like getting people to believe that smoking is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. uh, we still had to enforce that by saying, and by the way, if we catch you smoking in this building, there will be consequences. Right. So you, you kind of see a, a culture chain change needed in a way on the Internet so that people, e even though they're on the other side of the planet, they still respect each other and, and talk to them as if they're in the same well, room. And, and, and of course, uh, we the reason Shakespeare's plays are still so popular 400 years after he wrote them is that people haven't changed a bit. And in fact, uh, uncivil discourse is still as common as, as it was before, except now it's more broadcast. So what we've done is we've given everybody a big megaphone uh, and allows them to behave badly in front of seven billion people. Well, three and a half anyway. Uh, and I consider that to be an unfortunate outcome. And I hope that we can find ways of persuading people that that's not the healthiest way to use the internet. But uh, it's gonna take some work uh, to to persuade the general public that it should care about that. On the uh, so that's on the kind of the bad behavior side, but on the sort of good behavior side, this this idea, of, for example, finding a life partner uh, on the internet. Uh, it, do, like, do you see the the internet as enabling you to sort of search on a more like global scale for the kind of global optimum of say a life partner, um, or or is that kind of a bad idea? Because, you know, you, like if you're, if you're, say, searching for a life partner, you have, say, three billion people to kind of consider oh, if, if you're thinking right. about the entire internet. So is it better, what's the best way to think about it? Is, is it better to think kind of globally like that or, or just go back to what we've been kind of hardwired to, to deal with, like, say, our local neighborhood and finding, in a way, a local optimum? For, I uh, think it depends on what you're looking for. Let's imagine for a minute that you just want to find people who have common interests and you'd like to share your ideas with them and so on. The uh, search engines are really quite good at that. They you know, find you websites that have information on them you care about. You discover other people who are on the same website uh, and you know you uh, encounter each other. You might end up you know, uh, meeting. Uh, I found that to be a very positive aspect of the internet where you discover people you didn't know who are doing work that is relevant to you. Uh, we, we used to do that in the libraries where we pick up a, you know, a, an academic paper and we'd find somebody whose paper was interesting and we'd get in touch with that person. So I think internet has facilitated this discovery process and I'm pleased that it has. Um, but of course, in the end, it doesn't uh, absolve you of the problem of sorting out what kind of person have I just uh, connected with and do I really want to spend time with them. Right. It, it allows you to have that broader search in a way, but yeah. in, in the end, it comes down to back back to like person to person sort of interaction in a way. Like, is there trust? Is there like shared interests? Yeah, doesn't doesn't it always? I mean, it really, this, this a sustainable relationship is based on some mutual interest. Um, and then this this is a uh, this is just thinking in terms of uh, my my sort of career. Maybe I don't I don't think this question is sort of well phrased. But what would you say is the uh, fastest way to make money using the internet? I know that's not well phrased, but <laughs> uh, wow. Well, I you know I don't know ransomware. I, uh, uh, well, it's so far just in the last decade or so. It seems to be starting up a company. Uh, and getting somebody to buy you. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, that's a very short-term aspiration to start a company and sell it. Uh, I'm less attracted to that than I am to people who are prepared to make long-term commitments to get something done. Yeah. I, I've actually been running a business for the last 10 years, uh, and it's a website business, and it's it's sort of a marketplace for Stanford students. And the, throughout the entire 10-year period, there's been about uh, half a million page views per month, all like on the Stanford, uh, Palo wow. Alto, San Francisco IP, uh, and 80,000 visits a month. And it's all Stanford people. Wow. Uh, That's amazing. So, That's wonderful. So uh, so uh, when I go to dances, like for example, Viennese Ball, I don't, I don't know if they had that back in 19... 
73. But uh, uh, I, I, I would tell people I was, I'm dancing with it. I'm, 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 the, uh, I'm the one that built that website. And they, uh, they kind of react uh, sort of excited to, to know that it's me <laughs> that, that built the site. That's, that's cool. Wow. Listen, I'm afraid that we have run out of time. I have another call I have to take. Okay, so we'll sure. Have to wrap this up, but uh, I certainly enjoyed the chat, Fred. Re really appreciate talking with you. Thank you, Vint. All right, take care for now. See you on the net. See you.